Well, this is packed, isn't it? Welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Marcus Murphy, and you're in for a great session if you're in here. How many people came for Stephen Bartlett? Raise your hand. Can I get a woo? Okay, good, good, good. Well, every time you're actually given, I guess, the honor, the privilege of introducing really interesting people, uh, you don't want to mess up, and you also want to make sure that everybody has the right information. So uh, there's a couple things. One, you got to know that Stephen Bartlett is the youngest dragon in the history of dragons at 30 years old. Pretty great, right? Also, in addition to that, he has the number one podcast in Great Britain called The Diary of a Sea. Anybody listening to The Diary of a Sea? Yeah, okay. Look at these hands. Okay, this is great. Um, but here's the interesting part about him that I think maybe we are going to learn a lot about behind the curtain today, a little bit more information, um, is that he's also incredibly generous. He's very thoughtful. Uh, one of the things that he is really known for outside of that is that he just wrote a book called, uh, well, this is great, Happy Sexy Millionaire. How many people have read that? Raise your hand. Look at these hands. This is fantastic. All right. Well, I'm very excited because not only are all those things true about him, but today you're going to learn a lot more. So can we please give a huge, huge W Team welcome for Stephen Bartlett. On the right? Yeah, right. Look at these chairs. Ugh. How are we over here? I don't know. It feels interesting. Okay, do you want to move our chairs? Uh, uh, no, tell let's, me stay, let's stay here. Let's stay house. here. They might get, we might get in trouble. All right, well, you know, I feel like we have a little bit of time together, and I think there's a lot of different people here from all different walks of life. We have big businesses. We have entrepreneurs. In fact, raise your hand if you own your own business. Okay? Wow. Raise your, raise your hand if you work for a brand in here. Okay. That's really good, good to know, good information for Steven. I think we need to get to know you a little bit better, and I wanna start that way because I feel like some of these questions are good just to get a little bit more deep into your story. So the first question I have for you is, what can you tell us about Japanese clothing? Oh, sugar. <laughs> wow, okay. So when I was, um, wow, okay. See what I'm saying? I don't, I'm trying to figure out where you've read that. When I was, I don't know, 14 years old, I thought I could start a Japanese clothing website. So I went downstairs, asked my dad for 100 pounds um, to start the website, uh, went back upstairs, messed around for a couple of weeks and failed. But, I, but that was my first real attempt at starting a business, I guess, online. Yeah. And I was 14 at the time. So, but I've not written or said that anywhere, so I'm really compelled to, to know how you... Uh, I dig deep. I yeah. dig really deep. Um, so let's keep these small, quick ones going. Is it okay. true that you dropped out after one lecture at uni? Yes, and I'm pretty sure it was the wrong lecture. I'm like fundamentally unorganized in pretty much all elements of my life, and I've always been. I'm not saying it's not something I can change. It's just something that I've come to accept. And when I went off to university, with the assumption that it would be different from school, which I got kicked out of for not attending, um, I, I was messing around on the internet trying to find which room I was meant to be in. I hadn't registered for university properly. I found this timetable online, went to the lecture. It was a business course that I was studying. And I sat at the back, back of this lecture, and there's a guy, he's got this cardboard box, and he's making analogies about love. <laughs> now, I didn't want to say I was in the wrong room, so I sat it out. And then that was, my last, that was my first and last lecture at university, and I never went back. I deferred and then dropped out and uh, never went back. It's a very famous story. I feel like oh, there's a lot of really successful people that have definitely dropped out in between kind of that uni experience. Was it, what was it about that? Was it kind of just too structured? Was, it, was there something where it's kind of like, I just, did you feel uncomfortable? What was well, that? we're all completely different people and we all learn in completely different ways. And um, often when we talk about university and school and education, we end up conflating all of them and thinking that university is education or that school is education. It's important to separate the two things. I'm absolutely obsessed with education. I will fall asleep at night educating myself on anything from some technology innovation to marketing to business to Web3. That's my, my passion is educating myself. School, sitting in a room for hours looking at a whiteboard in that environment was not something that suited me. So my attendance hit, I think, 30 or 40%. They actually expelled me from school and then unexpelled me because, because quote, and I was on that TV show, Would I Lie to You? Which I, I'm not sure it's aired yet, but they brought out my headmaster, and I've got to pretend that I know him, as has everybody else. And my card said, this is Mr. Sprinkle. He's the guy that unexpelled me because I made him so much money. And that's the truth. He was the person that, when I got expelled, I took the form to him, 
and he ripped it up and he said, you're my little Harry Potter, I keep you under the stairs because you make the school so much money. If you get another one of these, come and let me know. And he unexpelled me. I ultimately got expelled in the last week of school because I guess I could make them no more money. But um, yeah. Okay. By the way, did you just say how you made them a bunch of money? Because Loads of things. So um, I'd done the deal for our school for the vending machines. I saw someone in our common room that was flicking through a catalog about to buy the vending machines for our school. And I thought it was crazy that we would pay for them. When we have thousands of customers, students in this school, we should be being paid to put them in our school, and we should be getting a cut. So I went to this, the computer room, sent a couple of emails, and it's funny, it's a crazy story. That same day, a vending machine company showed up at our school and fit our school with the machines a couple of weeks later. But they showed up to measure, and we got the machines for free, and we made a 20% cut. And then there was lots of other things. I was doing the school trips by the age of 16. Um, all of the parties, and I'd think of any reason to have a party. So we had an end of summer party, which about 3,000 kids came, so much so that the council were informed on the 26th of August. It just happened to be my birthday. You, might, you know what I mean? You might as well double up. Um, looked like I was popular. But I would do things like that, and I, I ran all the parties. I did deals all over the place, school trips. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that gives us a lot of insight into you, which is very important because at a young age, you kind of caught that and just a little bit of that outsider kind of outlier mentality. But I'm glad you did because at 22, if you don't know this, uh, you started your own business. Ed. Yeah, I think the most important context, which I've missed, is what was driving me. <laughs> and from doing my podcast, if you'd asked me before I started the podcast, what drives people, you know, people that are gold medalists or billionaires or successful in whatever pursuit they're in, I would have said, they are motivated, they are intentional, they are disciplined, those kinds of things. After doing the podcast and sitting with these people and really getting to the crux of their, their success in their life, I would now say insecurity and shame are much greater motivators than anything sort of intentional and inherently within us. I would say that in my case, I was driven by shame. I was the only black kid that I knew in a school of about 1,500 kids, other than my siblings. And my mother was the, the, the most black person that I'd, I'd come across in my whole time in Devon in 1992. Um, we were also the poorest family. So in the 18 years that I lived there, 16 years, I flew from Af I was born in Africa, flew to the UK. I never told any of my friends where I lived, because if they had seen where we lived, they would have seen a dilapidated house with smashed mirrors and six-foot-high grass. Um, and I had so much shame. And then I had this absence of my parents which taught me an accidental lesson that everything I have is going to be a direct consequence of something I do. Mm. So you have shame, and you have this huge amount of in accidental independence, and then you know, this underlying belief that stuff, money, would make me really happy, and this desperation to have it so that I could be enough. And off I go, trying to be that happy, sexy millionaire I write about in my book, yeah. thinking that if I can get my, you know, when I was 18, as you say, the front page of my diary, a friend of mine gave me this diary after I dropped out. I wrote, goals before I'm 25, make a million pounds, a Range Rover Sport will be my first car, S get a six pack, <laughs> and find a, a, a long-term relationship with a woman. That was my entire life, that, my entire orientation. Mm. I did it before I was 25, all four of those things, a Range Rover Sport was my first car. And by, when I wrote that, I was shoplifting Chicago Town pizzas to feed myself. I was in Moss Side, like really, on the edge. My parents weren't speaking to me. They haven't spoken to me for about two years because I dropped out. I'm the only kid that dropped out in our family. Um, but I was absolutely driven by that shame and that, that belief that if I could get stuff, then I will be enough. How did you feel when you got it? A tremendous sense of privileged anticlimax is the best way to describe it. Because <laughs> when I say it out loud, I, I understand how it sounds. I, I've, I've been there. I've, had, I've printed off the, the forms for job seekers allowance, I've been there, I've, I've, I've felt the pain, I've shoplifted, you know, all those things. So I understand what that, so when someone sits here and says those kind of things, there's a real sort of ignorant privilege to saying that it was, it was anticlimactical, but it also makes scientific sense that on that day, for example, when my, my company was worth, you know, there was a couple of key moments. There was one day where the Huck Group, probably shouldn't say that, but I've quit now, it doesn't matter, um, <laughs> wanted to buy our company. And so we go over to the Hut Group, we spend a day there getting the initiation, meeting everybody. And I come home and start thinking about selling the company. And 18 year, this is, I'm about 25 years old. 18-year-old Steve shows up and he says, let's get the Lambo. 
Mm. He types in autotrader.co.uk and he starts looking at 3 a.m. in my apartment at Lamborghinis. He then goes on Rightmove and starts looking at these mansions. <laughs> and then there's this, the, the other Steve, which realizes that I'd be exchanging my sense of like purpose in life for a car that I, that I don't want anyway, or a house that would take me an hour and a half away from my friends outside of the city. And this real internal conflict, which lasted for six months, because then I'm asking myself, well, why did you do all of this? If it wasn't for the things you've written down, why are you doing this? And it, when I say like mild existential crisis, I couldn't figure out what the point of my work was mm. if it wasn't for these things I thought I was aiming at. After that phase, I came to learn a lot about why I was actually doing it and the difference between fake ambition, which is typically written by your insecurities and shame and your pursuit of external validation, and real ambition, which is that voice inside of you that says you want to go and be a dancer in the hills of Peru because that's what you love. And there was a real distinction. Building my business was, was making me feel connected. It was giving me a sense of purpose. It was real ambition. But I thought I was doing it for these fake external goals, which was to buy a Lamborghini and stuff. Um, so yeah, a huge sense of anticlimax, almost like it's the closest I've, I've, got, I've gotten to feeling like depressive symptoms on that day when my company joined the stock market. And I called my business partner, and he was the exact same. You could hear it in his voice. We looked down at our phone. Social chains worth 300 million. Hmm. My business partner is like mildly depressed at the anticlimax. But I read about it. It's this thing called gold medal depression, um, which a lot of people talk about. Olympians, when they go to the Olympics, whether they succeed or fail, experience the same depressive symptoms. Um, and it happens throughout all industries where, and that should tell you something. It should tell you a simple lesson, which is our chaos is our stability. And stability that we often think we're aiming for, completed goals, nothing to aim for, everything in order, is actually chaos. If you look at any successful person or anyone that's achieved a great thing, their chaos happens when they, are, they have uncompleted goals. And they are most stable when they're, when they're striving. And that's just the nature of humans. I think a lot of us in here are trying to have gold medal depression. Uh, <laughs> and what's interesting about, no, I'm just kidding, but all of us are striving. I think that's a really interesting thing to say. So I want to know about this because back, let's talk about young Steven for a second. Was this like manifested? Did you, are you surprised by anything? Like we're sitting here with all these people and you're on your show and you're doing all these things. Are you surprised by it? Are you kind of like, I, sh I knew I was going to be here? So there's like multiple answers to that. First thing I think is important to say is that there was several moments of doubt. I have the real fortune of looking back at my diary. So there's, my diary tells the story. As much as I might like to give you loads of hindsight bullshit about how intentional everything was and how I had everything figured out, my diary tells a different story. And it's good for me to keep reading that because it's quite easy these days to like forget that you know, the, the first moment of insane self-belief is on page one of my diary, where I lie to my diary. And I tell my diary at 18 years old that I'm keeping this diary because a TV production company have asked me to track my story so they can tell my story one day. Bullshit number one in my own diary. <laughs> never, never understood why I wrote that in my diary, but it's, it's what I wrote. And then I was documenting my despair. I was picking up the CCJs and I was filming them on this Samsung phone I had, opening the fridge and showing there was nothing in there. So there was this sense of this was a stepping stone to somewhere else. And then you have other days where I go home because I ran out of money, for example, in Manchester on the Megabus. I get home. My mom screams at me that she wishes she had an abortion. I get back on the Megabus and I go back to Manchester. And I'm having those moments of like doubt, like I hope I've, I hope I've made the right decision here. Mm. Um, but I would say there's a, there was an overlying sense that my story wasn't going to end any other way. I distinctly remember one day on Facebook, seeing a Facebook page, context. Back in the day on Facebook, pages would go far, viral just because of the name. And you could click like in the feed, so you didn't even have to click on the page. So the names were going viral. And this Facebook page had the name, I know I'm going to be a millionaire one day, I just don't know how. And 1.7 million people had liked it. Hmm. And I thought, fuck, I'm delusional. Everyone thinks the same way. And it's funny, that was probably 11 years ago. And I still remember the amount of likes it had and seeing that page, because it made me think, you're not, you're like, you're not um, who you think you are. You're just deluded. Um, but there was, I have to say, there was this overarching feeling in me that my story would only end one way. And I, I have to say this as well, like, I would have been shocked if I was never a dragon on Dragon's Den mm. and if I wasn't here now. I, don't, I can't imagine another, even as a kid, I could not imagine another way that it ended. Mm. Um, on the point of manifestation, incredibly, 
And of course, there's tremendous luck in to, to everyone's story. On the point of manifesting things, I, I understand why people love that idea. Very easy, you know. Um, uh, but as, as I've said before, manifesting something is like putting the sat-nav in, in your car. If you all put the sat-nav in, in your car, in your garage in the morning, put it in, I'm going to the Excel arena to see this guy speak or whatever, what happens next? Zero. Mm. You have to put the key in, fucking mm, You have to drive. What happens if you don't put the sat-nav in and you just drive? You get lost. So you have to do both. You have to set the sat-nav, which is the manifestation, have an idea of the direction of travel you want to go in, and then you have to do the hard part, which is the long, agonizing work for an undetermined period of time. Unlike a sat-nav, there's no guaranteed time when you arrive. Um, but hopefully, if you're doing it for the right reasons, it doesn't really matter anyway. So that's interesting. I feel like that's an, a, a part of life, because all of us kind of want to get, by the way, we all kind of look at you and say you're the North Star. Like, you're, you've arrived. No, listen, hold on. Do you see his face? He didn't like that. But listen, it's true. A lot of us look and say, man, I would aspire to be that. Mm. But what I think is interesting is you just described this whole period where it was a dig under the surface slog of it all. Yeah. So did you, fall, did you love that? Did you love the part where no one really knew who Stephen Bartlett was and you were just kind of working and doing your thing? Did you fall in love with that part of it? Yeah, like to the first half of your question, I think it's really important for nobody to ever aspire to really be anybody else. <laughs> I even think this about me. I think especially the social media connected generation have confused as admiration with their own aspirations. The truth is like, all of the like, people you admire and you look up to, whether it's, I don't know, the Steve Jobs or Michelle Obama, whoever it might be, they are there because they pursued themselves. Mm. They are there because they had the like, courage of the convictions to believe that, in the case of the Wright brothers, they could assemble a tin can and fly it through the sky. They're great because of their individuality. Mm -hmm. And also, as it relates to happiness generally, much of the reason I do what I do is because of my shame and my insecurities and my childhood experiences the way that this piece of steep block was carved because of what happened to me for my entire life. My parents, what I saw, them arguing, all of these things. So I've built a life that's kind of the jigsaw piece to connect to, connect to my own experience. And that, admittedly, doesn't, has made me happy as I sit here today. In your life, and I think this is really important, it will be a completely different shape piece. And success has to be a subjective thing. Or you'll make the mistakes I made and you'll start aiming at things that you think will get you on stage and get you rounds of applause, you have to really, like, I really hope everybody tunes in to whatever that voice is inside of you that says, I want to go to Kenya and build an orphanage, or I want to go and be a violinist or whatever, and you, that is your North Star, not Stephen Bartlett. I, I really think a lot of people would be really unhappy if they, they aspired to be me, um, just being completely honest. But it works for me, because I'm fucked up in a certain type of way. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, but even I've had to unlearn some of my bullshit. Even I've had to learn the importance of balance, prioritizing meaningful connections, relationships, health, sleep, equally to all of the pursuit, purpose, and profession. I've had to learn that. And there was moments in my life where I didn't get that right, and I was lonely, and I had that growing sense of ugh in my chest because I was, just, I was going all in on building a company. Where are my friends? Where's my girlfriend? What's the point? Um, so it's just important. I, I, I get quite scared when I think of younger people tr aspiring to, to walk my path, because the truth is, if you want to be like, sat up here on the stage one day, it'll be because you walk your own. Sounds like a bit of a fuck, but it, that's how it works in life. All the people that have sat on the podcast in front of me, for example, are all sat there because they walked their own path, following that voice inside. So hmm. yeah. Fantastic. I feel like that's always really good to hear these things, because that really does paint the picture of you. But I do think this, we are at a travel event, yeah. and people here own businesses, and they are trying to think of things and hear things and glean to be able to go back and apply those and see real difference in their business and their lives. So I want to switch it a little bit, because you are a business owner, entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, investor, all those things. So when you left uni, you went out at 20, young 20-something 20 to start this what eventually became a multi-hundred million dollar business. Do you have anything that you've pinpointed with that type of growth? Because at 22, it was like 50 pound Facebook page. Yeah. And then it was like hundreds of millions of pounds. Yeah. So what was in that 
can you give us a little bit in terms of like the rapid growth part? There's so many things. <laughs> so there's so many like lessons I learned along the way that are transferable, very first principle lessons that everybody should apply to everything, in my view. So I mean, where shall I start? As it relates to the new business side of the company, how did we grow and get our clients to become Apple, Amazon, you name the brand? We did their marketing probably at some point, or at least in some market. Um, the most surprising thing I can tell you is that we never had a sales team. Mm. Which you imagine any B2B company or B2B agency, they probably have like a huge sales team. They're probably doing phone calls, emails, all of this outbound stuff. We never did that. I always called it like the door to door salesman approach versus a peacock mm. or a mousetrap. We were the peacock and the mousetrap. Our objective was we're going to tell stories that are so good, so compelling, so interesting that when I get off stage, there'll be a queue of people that are compelled by the story. And sometimes people think the way to tell that story, to win business, to build your personal brand, is to come with the facts and figures and graphs. But we all know inherently, within our own selves, if I came up here today and talked to you about facts and figures and graphs, you'd be looking at your phones right now. I know the things that will make you look up are the things where I talk about my own bullshit, my own struggles, my own vulnerabilities, my struggles with my mother. That's the stuff we can relate to. That's the emotional story. So why don't we do that in our business? I spoke at my peak before I resigned. I was flying 50 weeks a year. That's back to the point of not having no balance. Flying 50 weeks a year to speak on stage. And in every single one of those presentations, I started the speech with the same couple of sentences. I'd walk on stage. I wouldn't say my name. I'd say, I'd allow for the silence, because that always compels people. This is exactly why you were expelled from school. You are incapable of sticking at anything you don't believe in, and you always think you know a better way. Don't call me, and don't call any of the family until you go back to university. And with that, my mum hung up the phone. Now, that's how I would start a talk about my marketing agency. Because A, it would pull you in. We're going on a journey together. I'm going to tell you an emotional story. And on that way, you're going to learn a bunch of stuff about my company. You're going to learn a bunch of funny things. I'm going to be very vulnerable and open. And then it closed with the same sentence on 100% of occasions, which is, behind me, you would see a picture of me and my mom. And I'd say, and me and my mom have never had a better relationship. Thank you. And it, every single talk, ah. Oh. <laughs> and, and it was that. And there's a lesson in that about how to convey ideas, how to be heard and understood which is to tell really great stories. That was the crux of social chain. We did that online. We did that on stage. We did that everywhere. And because of that, we never had to hire a sales team, ever. We had people that picked up the phone, but we never had people that called it, called out. And then loads of other things. Um, the, the other one point I'll say for the success of that company, but all of the things I've been involved in, is this thing I call failure rate, which is our organization has to be the organization that outfails all of our competition. Whether you're running a social media channel, a podcast, building a business, or whatever it might be, we all believe and we all know intuitively that on the 8th of November 2022, no one ever in the history of mankind has ever had the challenge of solving the problems you're trying to solve in your life now, in the world that we currently live in. Let's say you're marketing a cupcake business. With everything that's changed in the world, the macroeconomic climate, the disruption of technology, Twitter changed last week, no one has ever had to solve the problem of selling cupcakes to this world ever. So the correct answer isn't going to be found in a book that takes two years to publish and is probably outdated. Mm -hmm. Probably not going to even be on a YouTube video where you're going to get advice. It's going to be a direct consequence of first party information that your team find from failing faster than everybody else. They say, we know failure is feedback. Feedback is knowledge, and knowledge is power. So failure is your power. And so how do you get your team to outfail all of your competitors? It's our number one thing in our office. We call it. Um, you know, Mondays I get a report of how many times in the last seven days my team experimented and failed. <laughs> um, social chain, when you arrived at the office, again, this speaks to the agility. 9 a.m. every day you get a text message telling you everything that's changed on social media in the last 24 hours if you work at our company. Why? I saw someone going, so why? Because our positioning in the world was to keep brands at the forefront of what's possible. So if we're going to do that, I need to keep my team at the forefront of what's possible. I need to create the most agile, failure-friendly culture possible. I can dig into how you do that, how you create a really failure-friendly culture, but that's at the crux of it. And um, lastly, I'd say this absolute obsession with finding any 1% marginal gain we can. 
That is the most used <laughs> phrase in the office. I just want to laugh at this yeah. because one of the questions I have, and by the way, this is a little cheat sheet, but I also like to get a little creative, but it says, and I, look, is Stephen Bartlett obsessive was one of my questions. Yes. I really want to know. Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, I was thinking about this as I was putting this t-shirt on to come here. And I was thinking about this idea of how the word obsessive is like quite misunderstood. It's seen as quite a toxic thing. Mm -hmm. People say, don't sweat the small stuff. My rebuttal to that is it really is a choice in life. It's a choice about the outcome. What I can say, and I'm sure something you'll all agree with, the gold medal Olympians I've sat with, the people that have built the greatest companies, the people that have the, the best, um, you know, built some of the greatest things in the world, were they obsessive? Sir David Brailsford, who sat in front of me and told me about the English cycling team and how he took them from obscurity to being the best record holders in the world, winning I don't know how many gold medals they won in those Olympics. He was, his thing was, I'm going to go to the, each pillow in the hotel room and feel it for firmness. <laughs> I'm going to see if we can make the, the water bottles 5% bigger to make our athletes more hydrated. It was the marginal gains, it's the tiny stuff. And it is the tiny stuff which we overlook and that's also easy not to do, but ends up making all the difference. Easiest way to prove this to you, if I ate a cupcake every, every day, if I ate like a big cupcake every day, I'd eat it, nothing would happen. No visible difference. If you eat a cupcake every day this week, nothing would probably happen. If I eat a cupcake every day for maybe five years, I'm, I'm going to move myself a little bit closer to heart disease and diabetes. In, in the case of my teeth, not brushing my teeth today wouldn't have an impact. Every day this week wouldn't have an impact. I might smell a little bit. Five years of not doing that, I'm in a dental chair and they're ripping my molars out of my mouth. When did it happen? It happened today because I didn't care about the small thing. Mm. And when you look at compounding returns, whether it's your hair, your skin, your beauty, your relationships, your company culture, all of it, it's compounding for you or against you right now, whether you know it or not. And you've only got to look at the Grand Canyon to see how much just Water, if it's consistent enough, can change the shape of the planet. Dripping water on anything will completely erode it after a long enough period of time. So we obsess about the small things. We, we believe that there's no stone that should be unturned. And the funny thing is, in doing so, you find a lot of big things. So on the podcast, I was saying this to my team earlier, we found a, a 15 second change to the podcast, which has meant that now we get a 350% higher subscription rate per view, i.e. one view now delivers a 350% greater chance that someone will subscribe because we changed 15 seconds of the podcast. That's not that, I mean, and you, you zoom out and go, okay, how would that have compounded had we known about that sooner as a team? Well, I know because we ran the numbers. We would have 3 million subscribers on YouTube now. We have 600,000, 620,000 now. And because we've discovered it today, in five years from today, which I believe is 2027, uh, November 2027, we'll have 12.6 million subscribers. Had I not discovered that 15 second change, we would have is it three, three and a half million subscribers. Tiny 1% gain. You zoom out, zoom out, you see how it compounds for or against you. It's a game changer. And it's a culture thing. Your team either thinks, cares enough to lift those stones or they don't. Um, Was that something, because like, are you that interested in the small minutia and details and everything else in your life? Is, did that come from something specifically? No, not, in, not in my relationship, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, it's just we all build evidence and we, we all build evidence about why things work and why they don't. And I've had the wonderful privilege of sitting with really smart people. Um, I've had the wonderful privilege of being able to look down into loads of different organizations at the same time. So whether it's Huel or whether it's another investment I've made or a big psychedelics business that we built with Peter Thiel in San Francisco, or my company in San, uh, San Fran at the moment called Third Web, or Flight Story, or the podcast team, or my personal brand, at all because I spent almost 10 years in the boardroom with the CEOs and CMOs of the biggest brands in the world, whether it's like the big fast fashion brands that people aren't so keen on now, mm. or whether it's Apple. We did the marketing for Uber across the United States. So that constant trying to distill down to what the essence of success is in these companies. So that's where I've got it from. And it's culture. Hmm. It's culture and incentives and the way, you know, you can take great people and put them in a really inhibiting environment and they become bad talent. You can take average talent and put them in the right culture and one plus one becomes three. You know, so it's all, my obsession is, is with nothing more than finding great people, 
and creating the right culture to make one plus one equal three. Um, it's amazing. And I can, I, you know, I, from working with the one particular business, which you will all know, <laughs> where they have two brands under one group, one's run by the dad and one's run by the son, I learned a very valuable lesson about speed and time being the greatest risk in business. I would take one idea to the dad's company. We probably have to wait nine months for Jenny to get back from annual leave to have a conversation with procurement and finance so that we can consider the idea, right? So I'd take the same idea to the son's business, and he'd go and get the team, then and there. He'd call them into the room, and he'd say to them, and all of their names, he'd go, we're going to do this today. I wouldn't have a contract. There wouldn't be any discussion. If it, we're going to do this today. We're going to try it now. And we're like, right, company would go. We all do it, try it. If it succeeds, fantastic, huge unlock. And I can tell you an unlock of their 15 million followers, 13 million of them came from one of those very quick experiments. An experiment we'd tried to sell to the dad, but after nine months of waiting, we just gave up. In business, so in the, the dad's mindset, what they're thinking is that the risk is getting it wrong. No, no, no. The risk was the nine months of waiting to find out you were wrong. The risk is procrastination in business. Because even if we were wrong in the son's case, within one day, we're on to the next thing. We're conducting the next experiment. And one in 10 of those experiments, maybe even one in 20, I'll take that, will change the game. Like I told you about those 15 seconds in our podcast. And this isn't just me. I read uh, Jeff Bezos's, I think it's autobiography or a book written, written about him. And the first sentence in the book was, at Amazon, full stop, experimentation is our strategy. That was the end of the page. And it went on to talk about how the Kindle, AWS, and all of these things were just experiments. How do you get your team to outfail the competition? And it's not by putting it on the fucking wall. We're innovators on the wall. It's not by standing in front of them and telling them. You have to go deep into these companies and look at the incentive structures, because people are usually just incentivized to carry on doing their current job. So you can't blame them. You've got to change the incentives. So, so it's interesting, you have a pulse on all that, which is just insane. Um, I want to know two things, which probably people want to know too. One, where are you getting your information? Because I think that like, it's interesting to know where you're kind of staying plugged in. Experimentation! <laughs> all right, Failure. Like, Failure. Softball. <laughs> and then the other one was, what, is, what, what are you paying attention to? And intentionally meaning that I think a lot of us out here are trying to sift through all this stuff you just said and yeah. all the AI and all this stuff's coming at us and we want to kind of figure out where we need to focus and you've got your hand in everything. How do you and what are you paying attention to? At the risk of sounding repetitive. So I could sit here and if you name a social media platform, I can tell you so many things about the algorithm that you would, you'd be like, oh my God, really? Like if you asked me about the LinkedIn algorithm and how to grow, grow reach, grow brands, how to promote a business, how to build a personal brand, how to build a company's brand, anything, video, articles, no, anything you want to know about LinkedIn, I can tell you. Right down to details of like having seen what the product engineer said in one interview seven years ago about the way the algorithm works, I can tell you everything about every algorithm. But none of it is useful to you because it could change tomorrow. It could change in three months. I know it's not going to be the same in six. So it'd be like giving you a fish as opposed to a fishing rod. The fishing rod is giving you a culture that has allowed me to find out those answers, which is exactly what I've said. It's like creating a, a culture within your company where learning is enjoyed, leaning into things that are completely alien, like Web3. What's an NFT? Leaning into skepticism, leaning into change, and then experimenting and messing around in the change. Then you have the answers. And the, most of my knowledge will probably expire in six months. But that's fine because we're, we're experimenting so fast that I'll have new knowledge. This is a very deep thing because you have to sometimes, especially in big organizations, you have to really uproot the incentives and the design of the team to, 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 to change the behavior. Um, I, read, you know, I did psychology in school and it was the only lesson that I attended. That's probably where my 30% came from. <laughs> I would steal the, the book. And I remember the prison studies, a lot of you will know the famous prison studies where, I can see you nodding, um, where they got Two groups of people off the street, they said, you're the guards, you're the prisoners. They gave them the uniforms, and then they left them be. They had to end the experiment within days because the people that were guards were being so inhumane to the people that were prisoners. The uniform, the place, the environment had begotten the worst behavior out of these normal people. And it's the same in business. You can take a really great talent that wants to innovate and wants to be proactive and all of these things and put them in an institution where that's disincentivized with all this red tape and it won't take long before they coast. And who's to blame them? 
I don't blame them. So conversation with the top a lot. And I can't, you know, I, a question I often get when I, when I talk about these topics is, it'll be like, what can I do, Steve? I'm working in a bank, and I want to be an innovator, and I want to... Uh, the short answer is good luck. The, the long answer, the long answer is like, <laughs> the long answer is even shorter, which is, you know, so it depends where you are, but um, the long answer is make your case. It goes back to my quitting framework. I'm going to share my quitting framework with you because I was going to say the short answer is quitting. So you're going to tell everybody here how to quit their jobs? Yes. So, okay, great, perfect. Great okay, speaker. Quit anything, quit your relationship, whatever. <laughs> so if you're in that bank, let's use the bank as an example, right? You're thinking about quitting. It's either for one of two reasons. They're both ambiguous intentionally. You can create definitions for them in your own world. Either it's because it's hard, right, like running a marathon, or because it sucks. So let's go down the it's hard side of the chart. Is the hardship worth the effort is the question you have to ask yourself. So you're on the 23rd mile of a marathon. You're raising money for a charity that's really close to you. It's hard, but it's worth it. Keep going. If it's hard and it's not worth the effort, that shit job, whatever it might be, the relationship, it's hard and it's not worth the effort, quit. Let's go back up the, the chart, come down the other side. You're thinking of quitting because it just sucks, right? Could be a relationship, a job, whatever it might be. Do you believe you could make it not suck? Key question number one. If no, quit. If yes, the next question becomes, so you think you can make it not suck. Is the effort it would take to make it not suck, marriage counseling, fighting with the executive team, fighting with the board, is the effort it would take to make it not suck worth it for you for the rewards on offer? The marriage, the relationship, the effort to change the bank and the way it works. If you believe you can do it and you believe it's worth it. If you believe it's worth it and you believe you can do it, stay and fight. If, it's, if you think you can do it, but it's not worth the rewards of doing it, quit. Very simple. This is the framework that I used to quit Social Chain in my mind. I realized this in hindsight, that this is what my mind was doing. At Social Chain, it sucked. I believed I could make it not suck. But at the point I was at and how much I'd been diluted, it was no longer worth it for me to spend potentially years fighting with a, a board to change this company's direction and having to kick off and you know, almost protest within my own company to, because I'd lost control, like legally lost control. Um, so I thought, well, now's my time to go. And I, I quit. So if you're in the bank, that's your framework. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to segue away, away from quitting uh, for a second. I'm just kidding. That's fantastic. Honestly, I think a lot of us are thinking about things that are probably how we framework and bifurcate our way of looking at how we do anything. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good framework for it. Let's talk about this, though, because I know, by the way, we do have a little bit of time for questions. We're going to have people that are going to run around, and you love that, though, don't you? Yeah, I, I, it's funny. When I do talks, I, I never allow the moderator to show me the questions before because I find it so, so much more interesting for me if I don't know what the questions are. So my favorite thing is always questions that I don't know the answer for, and yeah. All right, so we're going to leave a little bit of time, so be thinking about that if you want to ask Stephen a question just a little bit. Let's, let's transition to the podcast a little bit, because I think a lot of people here, and if they're a brand right now, I mean, I think my mom called me and wants to have a podcast. You know, everybody wants a podcast right now. Your podcast, however, just hit 10 million downloads a month. Mm. Yeah, yes, yes, congratulations. Um, and 74% of those listeners are between 18 and 34. How do you know all this? I mean, was that the... I'm smart as shit. Okay. So, <laughs> but, but listen, though, what's interesting about that is, is that I think a lot of brands out here are looking at it and going, well, two things. One, I want to tiptoe into podcasting. Is that a good strategy? And the second question is, 18 to 34-year-olds are a very hard market in the travel industry right now. The future of it is on young, young people, right? So I would love some advice on podcasting. I'd love some advice on how they reach and better connect with that 18 to 34. So um, it's interesting with the podcast because for the first two years, I remember after year two, we had, I posted the graph on, on my LinkedIn, 1,000 downloads in the month after year two. And then what you just said there, so we hit 10 million downloads a month in, I believe it was August. September. Or September, September. And then the month after, we hit 15 million downloads a month. And this, again, goes back to my point about compounding returns. Hmm. And I can show you the graph. It looks like all of the compounding returns graphs. Flat, they say it goes slow, then it goes fast. That's the phrase with compounding returns. Flat, Burj Khalifa, like that. It just goes, and it's lit, we're in this part here where it looks like the growth is a straight line upwards. But, it wouldn't, but all of that came from all of the, the consistency and experimentation over here. It came from that culture of like, 
and also being okay with the fact no one was listening at one point. Um, as it relates to podcasting, what advice would I give you? Because you're right, everybody does want a podcast, and it's a great thing to do. It's lots of fun. One of the things I would say for brands is, um, and for people, is podcasting is like no other medium or social platform or channel because there is no social network behind it. So growth doesn't happen on, on Spotify. If you think about where you've learned about podcasts, it's usually either one, seeing on social media, or word of mouth. It's one of the biggest sort of content mediums that's still growing by either real world or digital social um, word of mouth. Your friend sending you an episode on WhatsApp. We see it in our stats in the back end. It's, there's no art retweet button on my podcast to share it with other people on Spotify. There is not two billion people behind it. Mm. So you have, the growth comes from driving, from a few places, but driving word of mouth or having a big social following. So if you don't have millions of followers on Instagram or another platform, then your, your number one hope is creating a medium, uh, creating a concept and a format that is so inherently interesting that it moves via word of mouth. So if you wanted to start a podcast and your idea is, I'm going, to I'm going to interview interesting people, honestly, and I'm saying this to save you time and disappointment, and you don't have millions of followers outside of, the, outside of Spotify and stuff, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a nice way. Don't. It's, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. However, if you take a ton of time and really think about a format that is inherently word of mouth compelling and transferable from me to him in two compelling sentences. Like if I said, I'm gonna start a, a podcast where we interview people who are currently cheating on their partners and we interview the person they're cheating with and their partner anonymously. I'm gonna start a podcast where we interview people 24 hours before they die. Inherently word of mouth compelling and viral, press worthy as well. That's gonna be a great source of growth. For Hinge, when we launched their podcast, when Social Chain launched their podcast in the United States, our idea was called Ghost Stories. Very simple. You've all been ghosted on a, a dating app before. <laughs> I know you have. I have too. Nope. We've all been ghosted at some point, which was when someone doesn't reply to you. On Ghost Stories, the podcast, we bring someone in, they sit there, and they say they were ghosted, what happened, the person said they were going to meet me, I shut up, they weren't there. And then the curtain lifts and it's the fucking person. <laughs> I can tell by your reaction that that's an, an interesting enough two-line compelling, you know, uh, like title explanation that you'll spread that and you'll spread it effectively and the press will talk about it. Um, and there'll be great clips which will also help the growth. But that's the biggest thing with podcasting. I see this apps, this, ins this thing going on with brands at the moment where they all want to start a podcast. Um, they haven't thought about the format. Um, so it's, it's definitely absolutely not going to grow. And it's really not going to grow. Like, I really, really mean that. You know, you'll, if you've started a branded podcast, you'll see every week we'll look at yeah. 100 downloads, 107 downloads, 103 downloads, 107 downloads. And it will carry on like that if the format isn't inherently compelling. If you're not doing video, because video allows clips to travel and suck people in. You, YouTube allows the discovery I was talking about because of the algorithm and the recommendation algorithm. So that's just a way for us to suck new people in. Um, and brands need to be very, very careful when they get into that space because the cost of podcasting, doing it properly, is, is not to be sniffed at. It is expensive. If you want to video it, production, editing, maybe four or five people working on it, a lot of time to get 100 downloads. Mm. I'd, rather triple, I'd rather you triple down on LinkedIn right now and make the most of that super cheap reach. You can post a sentence and it can get 100,000, reach 100,000 people. I would quadruple down there. I would use that to build a huge audience and then bolt the podcasting in. I always say to brands, podcasting is a late stage strategy. <laughs> it's the thing you do once you've got everything else in order and you've, you've snatched the low hanging LinkedIn fruit. But for brands, I think maybe it's ego. I get it. Like I, I was probably in the same position. Everyone wants their own show, you know? Like, so. I literally am laughing. I, so I'm on the board at LinkedIn, and I just want to record that part of it. Uh, oh, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, no, no, let's, 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 let's do this before we get to the questions. So that, that demographic, that 18 to 34, that's really interesting to me because I think a lot of brands out here are thinking about it. And by the way, travel has taken a massive hit, obviously, and it looks pretty damn good now if you walk out of here. But I know that there's a looming recession coming up that we're all hearing about. There's all kinds of stuff that's coming back our way after we just got out of this shit. So what's interesting is I think that that 1834 is a gold mine in terms yeah. of thinking about it, but really hard to connect with. 
Yeah, do you know what? One of the things I will say um, as an opportunity for everybody, and this is in your personal life, this is in your businesses, this is if you're trying to reach 18 to 24, it's really everybody, is um, one of the things, and Simon Sinek said this on my podcast as well, that should have been on the bottom level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is connection. There will never be, in my mind, a human born who isn't yearning for a sense of connection and belonging in community. However, if you look at the nature of the world and the trajectory of travel we're on at the moment, connection is eroding. Community has been eroded. We don't have churches and pubs. I remember seeing all the articles about all these local pubs going bust in the pandemic, for example. I remember Theresa May was the first prime minister to appoint a loneliness czar. I read a study which showed that the average American, when they answered the question, how many people have you got to turn to in a time of crisis, their medium answer used to be three. It's now zero. And in a post-pandemic, digital, remote world, connection and community, although remain this fundamental yearning need that we all have in our lives, are in, lit are in smaller supply, but arguably in greater demand than ever before. And I, I obsess about this because I think about the future of how we're going to live, how we're going to work, how we're going to build our companies, how we're going to appeal to our um, customers, and how we're going to build social networks. And I know that I, I absolutely will bet on humans' desire for connection. So as a brand, as a travel company, if you can really lean into that demand, I think you have a huge opportunity. It's what we think about a lot in, in building my company cultures. Um, it's what I think about in the future of social networking, why I'm so bullish on Discord mm. and any close, and even Telegram, these platforms that are creating these really high value um, communities. I think they're the future of social networking. I, I don't know who's in the room, but I don't know what platforms are in the room, but I don't believe as much in the other platforms that aren't doing a good enough job of, of decentralized communities. So that's a big thing. For 18 to 34s who haven't yet built out their communities in the same way that people of a slightly older generation who have families and et cetera, and, um, I think that's a huge opportunity. Amazing. All right, before we get out of here, let's ask some fun questions because uh -huh. it's travel related, so you need to be 100% honest. What's your favorite travel destination? There's a lot, by the way, be careful. How many people out here represent some kind of travel destination? Raise your hand really quick. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's turn this into a bid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know, I love New York. I, I worked there for three years. I just feel like, I just love it. Um, for, for many of the reasons why now I chose to live in London, but New York just has this specialness about it, um, which is just hard to, this magic that you can't find anywhere else. I love Bali as well. My girlfriend lived there for two years, so I, I would go there for months um, to see her. I love the, the realness of the humans there. Um, yeah, those two places, I'd say. Okay, and you're a great storyteller, so I want you to tell a story about maybe a funny travel. I mean, you're traveling all the time, so tell us something uh, that might have gone awry or anything that you could share that might be kind of a fun travel story. Oh, a fun travel story. Uh, this is a lot of pressure to be funny, which I don't think I'm up to. <laughs> you don't have to be funny. <laughs> It'll be incredibly tragic. Go ahead. Uh, what you're, so it kind of links into some of the other stuff I've said before. When I was, I flew here from, I, Got on a plane when I was a baby with my family, of course, from Africa. Moved here when I was maybe two or three years old. And then, because we didn't have any money, we'd never been on holiday before, I didn't understand this concept of a passport. So at 21 years old, when I embark on my first holiday, I, uh, I showed up at the airport. <laughs> my friend had booked it. We booked these flights to Thailand. We were going for two months. And I rocked up at the airport. And the, the lady at the desk asked me for my passport. And I was like, what's the, what? <laughs> So I, didn't, I couldn't go because I, didn't, I had no idea what a passport was, and I was 21 years old. So I ended up racing to the Welsh, at the time, passport office, getting an emergency 24-hour passport like you could get back then, racing back to the, the airport and getting one the next day. But yeah. You always have it now. I do, yeah. <laughs> I'm going I'm to tell you a, a story about um, another travel story that changed my life, and it sounds so bizarre. But um, building off of that, so that was my first time on the plane. I get on the plane. I am 21 years old, and I cannot believe what the hell is going on. I'm like, we are in a tin can, and we are flying through the sky here, and we're going to Thailand. I'm, I'm that guy who was like, pull it, looking at everything. I'm like, the life jacket, like checking it's there. And I'm looking, I'm just in absolute awe of everything, because I can't believe it. Five years later, I'm traveling 50 weeks a year, and I'm traveling in business class and first class, and I'm rushing onto the plane as quick as I can, get my laptop out, boom, 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 get typing like this. And one day, I look over to my left and I see this wonderful lady with her husband in business class and they are like, oh, 
oh my God, they're, they're touching everything. They've got the sh champagne. They're, they're, and in them, I, and the slippers and they're putting the robe on <laughs> and they are having the time of their life. And in them, I saw old Steve. Mm. The Steve whose expectations of life hadn't changed. And I think I reflect on that because many years later, I had Mo Gowda on my podcast and he said a sentence which stayed, for, stayed with me. He said, we are happy when our expectations of how life is supposed to be going are met. And therefore, one would logically deduce we are unhappy when our expectations of how life is supposed to be going go unmet, i.e. a billionaire in Mayfair when their steak doesn't come medium rare like they requested, visceral anger. But in Botswana, where I was born, hot bowl of rice, joy. In this country, someone cuts you off in traffic. Ah! Fuck. Me on that plane, my expectations of life had changed. And so I wasn't happy. Mm. Same guy, just moved, my expectations had just moved. And that, for me, highlights that our happiness, much of it, not all of it, of course, is controllable, which is how do we stay on top of our expectations? How do I get on those planes every time and have the same sense of like, deep gratitude and awe for life? If I, if, I, if I keep that, I keep my happiness. If I lose it, I lose my happiness. Same in your relationships, your expectations of your partner, same with your colleagues, your expectations. I think they're the greatest source of our misery, and I learned that lesson from traveling. Yeah. That's amazing. What a great way to end my questions, that's on a high <laughs> note. Um, so we do have a little bit of time for questions for Stephen, uh, and you already have a, a bunch of hands. We have some mic runners somewhere. Maybe, why don't we start over here on this side? Do we see a seat? Do anybody have a hand over here? We'll start right here in the, yes, right there. Perfect. Hi, Stephen. Hey. Um, I see you've got a uh, whoop on. I've also got yes. one too. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what is, how often are you hitting your green recovery? And you also <laughs> talked about uh, balance in your life. What do you do to keep that balance and make sure you are recovered in your life? This is maybe my favorite topic because it's just something I don't talk about much. Um, a couple of months, so about two years ago, which I think it was about two and a half years ago when it was like real, the peak of the, the start of the pandemic in March, I believe it was. Um, I had a, a pretty life-changing realization. I'd been that guy who had said things out loud about my health and my fitness really mattering, but I'd never really lived it. I'd also been that guy who had said to myself every year, I'm going to get fit this year, and then I'd go to the gym every day in a really unsustainable way. My goal was get six-pack for summer. In my head, that was my goal. I think it's, a lot of us, we have those kind of goals, right? The problem with those kind of goals, much like the Lamborghini goal, is once you complete the thing, you become unanchored. Your motivation becomes unanchored. So every year, when either I'd get a six pack, which never happened, if I'm honest, um, <laughs> or summer would end, my motivation was out the window. And I'd get to October, and I couldn't, after going every day, I couldn't understand how any sane human being would ever step foot inside a gym. My motivation had completely evaporated. The pandemic happens, I see the fragility of life, I read these stories about, you know, about health and life and all of these things, and I just make the decision that my goals in life, my most important goals, should be goals I can't complete. So as it relates to my life, my professional life, my relationships, balance. Every day I get a new shot at balance. As it relates to my health and my fitness, it became consistency. And I've gone to the gym, and there's people in here who are in my fitness group. I've gone to the gym, uh, Grace Miller's in here, she's in, in my fitness group. 90% of days ever since then. We track it, we have a Google sheet, we <laughs> do awards every month. 90% on top of the table, Grace. 90% um, of days, which is <laughs> usually seven, t seven days a week. Sometimes it's just a light cycle, but I go every day. And this is about a broader point here, which is about my nutrition, my health, and all of these things, which is I also learned that I'd mi misprioritized my entire life. When I saw the fragility of life at my young, kind of naive age where I had the fortune of never getting sick, I had thought all this other stuff, business, cars, how, all this stuff mattered more. But there's this, there's this tectonic plate that all of my life sits up, my dog rests on it, my girlfriend rests on it, my family, all my companies and everything I've ever achieved rest on this tectonic plate called my health. You can remove my dog, I have everything else. You can remove my girlfriend, I have everything else. You remove my health, I lose it all. So in terms of priorities, my health has to be my first priority. It is my first foundation. And so like, how do I live that? This is one of the ways that I'm living that which is, for me, sleep is non-negotiable. My team know that. It's not, people think I don't sleep, I hustle porn star. No, bullshit. I sleep better than any. I'm, an, I'm a competitive sleeper. I, wore, I had the red light glasses on like an idiot last night so that I wouldn't get the, the red light from my phone so I could sleep better. I had all the blinds down. I'm fucking listening to the mute. I'm, I'm a competitive sleeper. Um, and all of that has, honestly, in terms of happiness and fulfillment, the balance point and the health point 
have been the biggest step forwards I've been able to make in my life in recent years in terms of happiness, fulfillment, everything. Sustainability, key one. So, yeah. Amazing, great question. Let's go all the way over here. Where's our, okay, we got one? All right. Hi, uh, my name is Rebecca, thank you. Um, I would like to ask how we can be more innovative in the travel industry because on social media, I think on the travel industry, I see most of the same, all reels, all videos, I see very similar content and how to be more creative, more innovative in these industries. And also I would like to ask if you have keeping an eye on the new platforms, which one do you think is going to be the next big platform, social mm. media? So how to be more innovative in the travel industry? Your, your um, observation is completely entirely correct. And you know, I, I get to meet a lot of people from a lot of industries, and you, what you see is it's like the whole industry has read the same book. Does it have? Like, like there was a book on how to run a travel business and how to market it, and everybody read it, and then they're all now doing that. And they're kind of disgruntled at the fact that they're getting meh results. I, same in the hotel industry. I remember speaking in their ho this big ho global hotel conference. And I said to the audience, like, how many of you currently, this was maybe six or seven years ago, have a check-in experience where I have to walk up and I have to wait there for like seven minutes for you to like make me sign this piece of paper and then give me this plastic disc? The entire room raises their hands. Mm -hmm. I say, which one of you's idea was that? It was none of their ideas. It's just the way it's always been done. So that they've got a really shitty customer experience because they've just they've, they've kept up convention. They've not done the hardest thing in all companies, which is what, I know he's a controversial figure, so just let me say the name without walking out, which is what Elon Musk talks about in terms of first principles. It's, it's how he says he created Tesla. It's doing the really, really hard work of thinking for yourself from first principles. A first principle in the hotel example would have been, which is a first principle truth, something we know to be true today about our customers and the problem we're trying to solve. A first principle there is, our customers in our hotels care a lot about their time. That's one first principle, which if you just use that alone and try to create a hotel with that as one of your first principles, you would never have had them standing in a line for potentially 15 minutes to check in and 15 minutes to check out and signing a form and messing around in a world where we have technology and mobile phones. That is just what I call unthinking. And that's what you have. But as Elon also says, it's impossibly hard to do this first principle stuff. It's so tempting and safe um, to do the accepting of convention. And this first principle strategy should apply to all facets of life, like with my relationship. Convention says you sleep in the same bed every night regardless. Now, if one of our first principles, so if we're optimizing for success and we're not insecure as a couple, and I know from my whoop or whatever else that if I'm getting up at 4 a.m. because I've got to go somewhere or she's getting up at 4 a.m., it's going to disrupt her sleep. And most of the high quality sleep happens at the end of the night, which means that if I get out of bed and wake her up at the end of the night, I could literally cost her about 75% of her actual quality sleep just by costing her another hour or two. Mm. Then on that day, I'll go sleep in the spare room when I know that I'm going to disrupt her. Now, that's the first principle. Convention goes, you don't love me, babe? <laughs> you want to sleep in the you know? But me and my girlfriend, we have two, two different rooms. All of her stuff is in the her one bedroom, all of mine's in the other. We sleep in the, the same bed 99% of the time, but we're also like, open to the idea of rebuilding our relationship from first principles. This is super controversial. <laughs> Marriages and weddings. I mean, if we've learned anything about sexuality, maybe we should be a bit more open to how two humans come together and form a bond. Maybe we should interrogate convention on site, accept much of it, because so much of it's still true, but it's the interrogation of convention. It's whether your team think and do that, which is the hard work, rewriting a blueprint. That's where all the rewards are. That's where all the breakout companies come from. That's your Netflix, that's your Tesla, that's your Apple, that's even, to be completely honest, that was our podcast the decision to go to promote our podcast insanely by social media. By when the, the podcast is made, there's 20 social clips. On um, Maisie Williams, the social clips did 130 million downloads, uh, views on TikTok and Facebook, and the podcast did like three or four million down. We are a social first podcast. Every second of it is first principles. So it's that first principle thinking. It's a culture thing, it's a people thing, yeah. All right, listen, put your hands out. If it's quick, 
Okay, if it's a quick question, keep your hands up. All right. The answers need to get quicker. That's my problem. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, everybody loves it. Let's go in the middle. We haven't had a middle. Right here, uh, hand up there. Yes, waving at me, waving at everyone else. There we go. We'll wait for her. Have a glass of water. There we go. Two microphones. A uh, couple quick things. First, I'm from New York, so thank you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Secondly, I have a video-only travel app called Navi Savvy, which uses upload unedited videos. My question is, I have been preaching to this industry for almost nine years about short-form video, and yet nobody's been willing to make a change. How would you say I am best here, besides standing up now, of telling people that this is changing an industry that is slow to change? Uh, it, it, it's, the answer here is, I guess, somewhat linked to another point I made about um, how you get your teams to innovate and stuff like that when you're like the CEO, because just telling people is actually a really ineffective strategy. Um, everybody's beliefs are based on evidence. And that's, the true, that's also true for the belief in yourself, your self-belief. Your self-belief is just evidence. Maybe it's wrong evidence. Maybe it's right evidence. It's the evidence you got from the thing that happened on the playground. It's the evidence from the thing that your dad or mother said to you. It's the evidence from all the experiences you've had and what you've got from them. So when I did my first public talk at 14 and I fucked up and my hands were shaking and I cried and I left the stage, the evidence there was fucking, you are not good at that. You are not a public speaker. And our evidence can, it dictates our life and our decision making. To answer your question, saying it is not enough. Opinions are not enough. People want compelling emotional evidence. And how you deliver that is much like what I said earlier. The compelling emotional part is the storytelling. And then the evidence part is um, making sure you can deliver a case for an irrefutable, often em em empirical or quantitative case for what you're saying. And also, do you know, when you're building a company and you're super high conviction, every day question yourself. Every day. You know, I've spent a long time building a company called Wallpark. That's what I dropped out to build. And I was just fucking wrong. I made an assumption that the market wanted to behave in a certain way. What I didn't realize is that Facebook existed. And you know, so I was competing against something that already existed. Ultimately, Social Chain was born out of a pivot where I said, you know what, forget it. Instead of fighting Facebook, and I'm thinking this now about your business, I'm going to join these major platforms and build a business on top of them. And that's why Social Chain was ultimately successful. Great, thank you. Fantastic. Also, I'm fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. Everybody, if you had a great, great time and you got a lot out of this session, please make a lot of noise thank for you. Stephen Bartlett. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you.